Welcome back. This is lesson two of our study of the New Testament book of Ephesians. And aptly enough, today we will be in chapter two. Uh, when we're reading these New Testament letters, these epistles, uh, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. We're kind of reading someone else's mail. I mean, we've got letters addressed to specific groups of people, in this case, Christians living in the church in Ephesus. There were others, the Thessalonians, the Romans, the Galatians. Um, but obviously, they also have something to say to us today. And so we're trying to do two things in this study. We're trying to understand more deeply what the original message was, what issues was Paul in this case addressing, what was the church in this particular city struggling with, and what do we struggle with today, and how do these inspired words change us? impact us today. I told you last week, Ephesus was quite a city. It was a pearl of the ancient world, a economic hub, a cultural political hub, and also a place where many different pagan gods were worshipped. And so Paul is addressing Christians living in this, in this pressure. Um, we have our pressures today. They had their pressures as well, surely they dealt with many of the same issues we have today. Uh, relationship issues and financial troubles and health concerns. Uh, and also, the pressures of trying to be a Christian in a city that was not a Christian city. Uh, so Paul, as he writes this, is uh, a prisoner in Rome. He's being held by the Roman government there. And he is writing to the church in Ephesus, a church which he had planted several years later, uh, earlier rather, and then a church which he had spent two to three years in another visit uh, strengthening and working with. So chapter one, uh, we did in our first lesson, very broad strokes on that. Um, Paul is laying kind of uh, the theological groundwork of the rest of this letter. Um, it is, frankly, gorgeous. It is something we need to take in. And last week we talked about how kind of Paul was walking them up to the heights, uh, having them take into the view from their high standing with Jesus. And what a view it was. They have been adopted into God's family because of Jesus. Uh, they have been uh, given uh, verse 3 in chapter 1 every every, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. They are lacking nothing in Christ Jesus. And he has showered upon them, lavished is the word that we saw in chapter 1, lavished upon them his grace. Uh, we talked about how that word means gifts. It, it can be uh, blessings that we enjoy. We have uh, been experiencers of the lavish grace of God. And he reminds them also that with all of these gifts, with all of his high standing, uh, they've also been kind of given a role in the world. They are to stand out. In verse 1 he says, you are the saints. That means you are the holy in Ephesus. You are set apart is what holy means. And so they are supposed to be distinct from the world. They live in it, uh, but they are to influence it and not be influenced and, and directed by it. So finally, in the first lesson, um, like we talked about, he talked about what it means to belong to the family of God. Uh, you are not alone in this world. You are not a spiritual orphan. You belong to an amazing family of sisters and brothers in Christ. Before we get to the text this morning in chapter 2, I want to ask you something. Um, no one is perfect, right? I, I don't think anyone's going to argue with me on that. We all make mistakes. We all blow it. We have thoughts that are incongruent with the nature that we've been given in Jesus. Uh, we have some attitudes, we have some behaviors, we have some singular things that we do from time to time that do not give glory to God, uh, that do not represent uh, the people that we are called to be in Jesus Christ. So occasionally, we all fall short of the ideal, right? Um, however, while we all fall short of the ideal, we react in different ways, probably a lot of different ways, but I would say there are two main ways that different people react. One is realizing that they have fallen and fallen so many times before, made so many mistakes before, and probably are destined to continue making some mistakes, being imperfect, struggling. Some people just kind of quit on the Holy Spirit project. 
they just kind of check out on the idea of being transformed into better human beings, into stronger, more mature disciples of Jesus. I mean, what's the point? I'm just going to keep messing up anyway. So some people kind of have these low expectations, kind of uh, shoot for not the sky anymore, but just kind of shoot for the status quo and, hey, I'm saved, but, you know, I don't think I can really change all that much. Uh, And then there's another kind of person. It's a person who is in the struggle a person who is in the middle of the fight. They know they are imperfect. They know that they struggle. They know that they will probably continue to struggle day after day, but they have chosen to take a stand against the currents of sin in their life, uh, against the feeling of of hopelessness, hopelessness that they can never change. And so, to be totally honest, Some of us right now fall into that first category. Uh, We've just kind of accommodated ourselves to the way things have always been. Uh, We've been frustrated at trying to change and nothing has happened, so we're just kind of going with the flow at this point. And others of us are in that second camp. We are in the struggle. We know God wants more for us. We know that He has resourced us to grow into the image of Jesus, and we are fighting for that along with the Holy Spirit. Paul will say in Galatians 5, it's walking in step with the Spirit. And so we're fighting to stay in step with the Spirit of God. Um, So some people have quit trying to improve improve in a general sense. Others are fighting to improve um, because Uh, They think it's worth it, and they believe they are called to more than who they are today. Um, Well, the Ephesians were like us. If you're a Christian, the Ephesians were like us, redeemed sinners. People who had a past, a colorful past, each of them with their own different sin struggles before they were Christians, And in this moment, as Paul is writing them, we're going to see later on in this book, clearly they continue to fight against the power of sin and darkness in their lives. And so we can imagine from what Paul writes that some of them were category one, some of them were category two people. Some of the Ephesians had kind of like, eh, what's the point of fighting? What's the point of struggling? Uh, We're all human after all. I mean, we're all mistake prone. So what's the point? And others were truly at war with the flesh and and seeking to align themselves with the Spirit and truly fight for something greater that they knew God had in store for them. So hold on to this as we jump into the text right now in Ephesians chapter 2. To me, the most powerful passage in Ephesians, in the entire book, is what we're going to talk about today, verses 1 to 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes, And you, you Ephesians, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Paul writes here that each man and woman in Ephesus was once dead in their trespasses, lifeless in the middle of their sin addictions, flatlined, moribund. They were spiritual corpses, sober, but honest analysis of the state of any human being without Jesus Christ. It's not happy, but it is sincere. But even in this bleak picture, there is hope. Um, There's a word that appears a couple of times in those verses I just read, and it is the word were. Verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses. And then he talks about how you were children of wrath. In other words, there was one reality before you met Jesus. And there is another reality now that you have found your life in Christ. Something changed, and we're going to get to that in just the next few verses here in a moment. But for now, it's important for us not to lose sight of how far we have come. We were lost. We were without 
hope on our own without Jesus Christ. We were enemies of God. Um, and we were, verse 3, living in a state where we were, um, he says, carrying out the desires of our bodies and minds. So we were being carried by our, our lusts, our desires, our urges. We were just kind of being pinballed through life by all of these um, impulses that we had inside of ourselves. And so I think we need to pause here and we really need to see something in the text. It is easy to think that the place of freedom is that place where you are just going with whatever it is that you want in the moment. You know, no impulse control. You are following your desires. That is what it looks like to be a liberated person, to be a person who lives without shackles, without restraints. And in reality, Paul tells us here, that is a place where you have to use a philosophical term, you have lost your agency. Uh, to use more common vernacular, you've actually lost your freedom. Um, it is a place where you are following the agenda of something or someone else. And he says in verse 2, you are actually following an agenda set by your um, sort of invisible puppet master, the prince of the air, the one who is pulling the strings in the life of one who does not restrain their passions or their desires, but just gets carried along by them, is one controlled by Satan. And this adversary, this enemy, does not have our best interests at heart. And so as people give themselves over to these cravings, to these desires and thoughts, they become more and more under the control of the influence of the evil one. He controls them, if you will, from a thousand invisible strings. And he does not lead them to a place of life, but to a place of death. Strong sin addictions develop. And those impulses begin to control every spare thought. They begin to control the instinctive ways that we talk to other people, the things that we say, and they begin to influence our relationships with other people. To call that freedom is absurd, right? I mean, that's not free at all. That is living uh, bound up under control of someone else. So Paul just kind of pulls the curtain back and says, hey, this is how you used to live. You remember that, right? And when you were in that place, you were not free at all. You were being controlled by the evil one. So he just calls them to remember what it was like to live under the destructive, malevolent force of the evil one. I mean, think about the original sin story. Um, you go way back to the beginning of the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve. Um, they thought they were moving toward freedom when they listened to the serpent. They thought, we're going to show off the, throw off the shackles of God's rules and ordinances. We're going to call the shots. In fact, the temptation was, we are going to what? We're going to be like God. Go back and read those first chapters of the book of Genesis. We're going to be like God. And so they thought they were cutting themselves free and moving into this expanse of liberty and, and agency. And what they found was they were separated from God, the one who gave them life, the one who provided day after day this paradise for them. And they found themselves lost in a world of danger and disappointment. So Paul, back to chapter 2, he doesn't write to them, hey, my Ephesian friends, remember back before you were Christians when you used to really be free? No, that's not what he says at all in verse chapter 2, verse 1. He says, remember what it was like when you were carried around by your shifting desires. Remember what it was like to be dead in your transgressions and sins. And just to make sure that we don't read these words that Paul penned to these people in Ephesus 2,000 years ago as something that, you know, it doesn't apply to me. It applies to those people so long ago. Paul says right here in the text we read in verse 3 that we all 
used to be like this. So the situation that he describes of them, it's also my situation before coming to know Jesus, your situation before coming to know the Lord. So how do we make the move toward true freedom? How do we break free from this cap captivity? How do we uh, cut the strings between us and this puppet master and, and the destructive kind of sin trajectory that we have been on? Well, to try to visualize this scene, I've written a little story for us. It goes like this. A young woman was walking through the jungle and suddenly discovered that she was sinking. Yes, she had walked right into a pool of quicksand. Well, she's alone. So panic and hopelessness set in. Um, she moved around frantically, flailing her arms, moved, churning her legs. And what happened was, was she began to sink more quickly into that quicksand. Her strategy was not getting her out. In fact, it was getting her deeper and deeper into this trap. Slowly, her body became more and more imprisoned in that quicksand. She began, she began to be just more and more enveloped and wrapped up in the sand. Well, another woman, unfortunately didn't end well for her, another woman a few days later stepped into the same fix. And like the first woman, she began to slowly sink. But she did not begin with flailing and grappling with the sand that was slowly enveloping her. She didn't, in fact, move a muscle. She got very, very still. She knew that trying to pull herself out of that situation was not going to work and would, in fact, hasten her descent into the miry depths. Now, what she did, while she wasn't moving, she did something. And that something was first to cry for help, to yell as loud as she could, help me, help me, help me. And at the same time, she began to look urgently for something within reach that she might grab a hold of that she could use to begin to pull herself out. And then she saw it um, almost, but not quite buried under the surface of the sand. There was a strong root. Um, she could just barely reach it. Um, whether or not it was strong enough to hold her weight, she wasn't sure. And so she dramatically lunged for it. It was all she could do to trust in that as her only hope. And well, she got a hold of it. And with a lot of patience and all of the energy she could muster, over the next 20 minutes or so, she was able to pull herself up onto the bank and to safety. Her heart raced, and then she dusted herself off and continued on her journey. Now, here's what most people try to do when they get themselves in a stuck kind of situation when they find themselves in a destructive habit or behavior or addiction, they begin to frantically work as hard as they can. They aren't necessarily strategic about it. They're just like, I've got to do something and I've got to do it quick. And the struggle um, and perhaps even the panic that goes along with it, it, it tires them out and shortly they begin to lose hope. And the cycle then, as they sink, it repeats. They try again. They try again. They try again. And they sink and they sink and they sink. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, the one strategy that doesn't work is trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Uh, obviously, also, just kind of ignoring the situation and pretending that there is no danger, uh, that doesn't work as well. Both of those approaches are hopeless. Both lead to death, pretending that you're fine or um, working as hard as you can, as quickly as you can, without ha having something uh, strong to hold on to, without having help. Neither of those approaches works. So good news, literally the good news, the gospel is that while all of us have sinned in our lives, all of us have you know, fallen short of the glory of God, God has given you and given me something strong 
to hold on to. He has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has given for us the good news. That is where we find help. That is where we find rescue. That is where we find the grace of God. Chapter 2 again, pick up where we left off in verse 4. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We're going to talk a little bit about two words there. One is mercy, one is grace in just a moment. But first, clearly, he says, you have been saved by grace. That was your lifeline. That was the root that you were able to grab a hold of. Grace in the Greek is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. We get the English word charity from it. Uh, you can also translate it, obviously, as grace or as a gift. Um, but it is an act of charity. God saw our pitiful state. No offense, but that's where we were, dead in our trespasses. He saw our pitiful face. He was moved. God loves us. God loves all lost people. And so he would not allow us to be swallowed up by our own deadly sin nature and the schemes that the enemy was working out to destroy us. God tossed us something strong to hold on to, the gospel. So we get to chapter, uh, verses 6 to 8. God raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His riches for you and for me and for the Ephesian church, those riches were immeasurable. Uh, you can't do an accounting of all that we have received in Jesus Christ. The fortune is just too great. Isn't that amazing? And so Jesus is the lifeline that God sent to pull us out of our situation. He is the only hope of sinful, sinking, desperate, lost people. People who, like the Ephesians, were at one point dead in their trespasses. And Jesus, I want you to know this, Jesus is stronger than any scheme of Satan. Jesus is more powerful exponentially than any weapon that your enemy can use against you. In fact, Paul, back to chapter 1, kind of worked through some of that. Your friend, your savior, your rescuer is chapter 1, verse 21, the Lord, the kurios. So he is over all things. Um, he is, verse 21, far above all rule in the heavenly realms. Think about that. He's far above every other power that's out there. And then he also, in that verse, it's, Paul writes, has all authority, all power, and all dominion. So in case you're wondering, yes, Jesus is strong enough to deal with with your sin situation. Have no doubt about that. He can get you out of the mess that you have gotten yourself in, spiritually speaking. Um, if you're wondering about that, you can count on Jesus. You can trust in Jesus. You can put your faith in Jesus. Verse 8. Let's talk about grace here. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It is not your own frantic motions, it is not your own scheming, it is not your own panicked activity to save yourself. In fact, grace demolishes any self-salvation project. Look at what he said. You are saved through grace. This is not of your own doing, it is a gift from God. Um, so what is grace? Well, we'll start uh, defining it by talking about the opposite of grace. The opposite of grace, by the way, is not something bad. It's also something good. The opposite of grace is justice. Justice means getting what you deserve. I love justice. I want to fight for justice. 
I want to represent God's justice in this broken world of shadows, but at the same time, I deserve to be held accountable. And I have done things that are not right. I should be punished for the sins that I've committed. And so should you. Look, I guess it was two weeks ago, um, I got stopped for speeding. And I deserved to be stopped for speeding. I was going over the speed limit. Um, I earned the ticket. Now the officer could have let me off with a warning, but he chose to write me a ticket. Now mercy, mercy is this. So, so justice means getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. If he had said, look, you were speeding, but I'm going to let you off with a warning, that would have been mercy. That would have been not getting what I deserved. That police officer could have shown me mercy instead. Uh, I had to pay a $165 ticket, my friends. Now, God does show mercy to us. God is a merciful God to be sure. Uh, we don't get what we deserve. Glory, hallelujah. We don't get what we deserve. Praise his name for that. But grace is a little bit different from mercy. Remember, mercy is not getting what we deserve. Well, grace is actually receiving what we don't deserve. Like, mercy would be not having to pay a $165 ticket. Uh, grace would have been that police officer pulls out his wallet and hands me a couple hundred dollars. Now, that would be truly getting, receiving what I do not deserve. Um, so, in spite of our sin and rebellion against God's plan for our lives, against His holiness, against His word, against His love for us, He sent Jesus. He sent His Son. He sent His grace in human form on a divine rescue mission to pull us out of the situation that each of us had gotten ourselves into. In Christ, I have not gotten what I deserve. Thank God. In Christ, I have gotten what I did not deserve and could never have earned or deserved the unmerited favor of God. Verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Saved by grace through faith, not a result of works, so that we can't boast about it. We can't be proud in our individual accomplishments, spiritually speaking. I think there's great freedom to be celebrated in what Paul has just penned for the Ephesians and us. Like grace means we are free from the impossible burden, the, the, the heavy weight of trying to haul our salvation up to the mountaintop by ourselves, having to earn it on our own. No one has to work for their salvation. No one can merit themselves into a correct relationship with God. And that's a good thing because it is impossible. It is impossible for someone to earn favor with God. Well, I guess there was one exception and that was Jesus. But the rest of us can't do it. Uh, there's also freedom from self-centered pride. I think pride is another millstone around the, wreck, uh, the neck of people. Um, since we are saved by grace, we know that we don't get any credit for our rescue. Uh, no one ha who has been pulled out of the quick sand of sin um, gets to come out in a state of, you know, patting their own back, of self-congratulating no, when you are rescued and you know that rescue was totally dependent on someone else, you feel indebted and you feel glad and you feel grateful, thinking somehow that I might deserve applause for being a Christian, believing that I have 
had something to do with my salvation would kind of be like that little boy in John chapter 5. Jesus, you know, needed to feed thousands and thousands of people. He found this little boy who had the two fish and the five loaves, and the little boy contributed those to Jesus, and then Jesus multiplied those miraculously and fed over 5,000 people. It would be weird, right, for that boy at the end of that story to step up to the microphone and say, hey, I just want to say to everybody, you're welcome. You're welcome. I fed you lunch today. I know you guys owe me big. Um, uh, you can write me thank you cards and send them to this ad address in Nazareth. Um, don't you all know that, you know, it was me. I provided the food. I mean, that would just be weird. That would be so ridiculous. What the boy did in John chapter 5 was merely surrender what he had to Jesus. Opened his hands, let go of his tiny little morsels, and that's what we do when we are saved. We throw ourselves onto the mercy and grace of what Jesus did at Calvary. We totally surrender. We offer you nothing, and we accept everything. Eternal life from Jesus Christ. Our part, as Paul says here, is to have faith. It is to trust that the gospel is strong enough. It is to trust that that root that God has given us, the root of Jesse that God has given us to hold on to, that it can support our weight and get us home. Um, each time, brothers and sisters, each time we look to the cross, we are reminded of the incredibly high price that Jesus paid to redeem us, to buy us back from the evil one, to set us free, to make us right with God, to wash away our sin and our shame. Jesus did that for you. He did that for me. And now, the challenge, and Paul finishes with this in these first 10 verses, the challenge is now to grow into this amazing gift, this salvation that we have been given. We don't stay parked. We grow into the image of Jesus. We are not just saved from something. We are, Paul tells us, saved for something. So let's pick it up again. Verse 10. Paul writes, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's the deal. Salvation is not like being given a free like plane ticket. And you get it, and you just kind of go to the airport departure lounge, you know, gate 32 at DFW, and you just sit and you just wait for that celestial plane to arrive and God is going gonna, is gonna to whoosh you up to paradise. That's not what it looks like to live as one of the redeemed. That's not it, what it looks like to live in the salvation that you have been given. And honestly, some Christians kind of treat it that way. They don't believe that the gospel that saved them is a gospel that is strong enough to transform them, to change them. And so they kind of find themselves, you know, go to church sometimes, read their Bible sometimes, but basically marking time until Jesus returns or they are called home to glory. They're in the, you know, the departure lounge. Well, verse 10 says, we are God's workmanship. We are not self-made men and women. We are products of the work that He did for us at Calvary and the Holy Spirit that He has given to indwell us. D Jesus did not simply suffer and die on the cross to give us an exclusive membership card to a heavenly country club. Okay, that is not what Jesus did for us. The cross of Jesus is not merely an evacuation plan, it is a transformation plan. 
We are being transformed from glory to glory. We are to look more and more like Jesus, think more and more like Jesus, feel more and more like Jesus, speak more and more like the Lord. Every single day being transformed by the power of His Word and the power of His Spirit who lives within us. Paul tells the Ephesians, you are God's workmanship. You have come off of God's assembly line and He has great things planned out for you. Good works from before you were even born planned out for you. So God didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something. Um, And if we trust Him and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and we join the struggle and the fight to claim what God has given us through the gospel, to fight, to become those new people that He wants for us to be, and we join in His redemptive work, then we will see these good works of God unfold in all sorts of relationships, friendships, marriages, work relationships, church relationships, relationships with your lost neighbors, we will see God's work unfold in that place. Uh, And then we will be about ministry work, serving God, bringing glory to God with what we do, with how we use our money and our talents and our time. So part of our work, obviously, is to help get the good news out, right? Um, It's not just for preachers. It's not just for teachers or elders to share the gospel. God has given you relationships where you will have opportunities to talk about the Lord, to be a witness for Jesus, to bring people toward that saving grace that they can hold on to and be delivered out of their trespasses and away from the power of the evil one. You are an instrument of God's redemptive work. You are God's workmanship, and He has good works prepared for you to do. In your marriage, in your family, in our lifestyle, in our decisions and choices, all of us uh, work to serve a fallen world and share God's love and bring hope and help to those hurting people around us. Let's finish this study in prayer. If you would bow your head, close your eyes, and pray with me. Lord, I thank you for creating us. And in spite of watching our colossal fall, in spite of our having messed up who you always wanted us to be, rebelling against you and sinning, you didn't quit on us. We celebrate that, and we praise your name for that. Thank you for giving us, Lord, not the justice that we deserved and not simply the mercy that we needed. But thank you, Lord, for supplying the grace to help us change over time into being the people that you want us to be. We are thankful for the gospel that saves us, And we invite you to help us see how and when and with whom we can share the good news of Jesus with those around us. Lord, we are your workmanship. We place our thoughts, our hearts, and our entire lives in your hands. We pray this with gratitude. In the name of Jesus, amen. Until next time.